And boom goes the dynamite. Welcome back to Banging the Can, the Houston sports show that does not apologize for championship rings and tings presented by Bolin Media. I am your host, Ross Bolin. And that right there was a very good, very productive weekend in Houston sports. For the first time in five years, your Houston Texans were featured on Sunday Night Football, beating the Chicago Bears 19-13 to at NRG Stadium to improve to 2-0 on the season. Exciting matchup on paper with number one pick Caleb Williams against last year's number two pick and offensive rookie of the year, C.J. Stroud. But this ended up being a pretty dog shit, frustrating football game after what I would define as a misleading start. The Texans had a solid first half. Had a few penalties, but not an altogether terrible half of football. Went into halftime up 16-10. to 10. Then came the second half, and it got sloppy on both sides of the ball. For both teams, really. The Texans committed a whopping 12 penalties in this game for 115 yards. 12 penalties. We had more yards and penalties than we did rushing. Not great. Not ideal. You are not going to beat very many NFL teams playing that undisciplined, which obviously D'Amico Ryans and the boys know, and they need to focus on that in practice this week. Uh, The penalty thing, to a certain extent, it's on the coaching. It's on D'Amico Ryans and the coaches to a certain extent, for sure. But it's also on each individual player to commit to details and precision and self-discipline that they simply did not show during this game. Uh, it was it was just one of those NFL games. Every once in a while you watch one where it's just like, it feels like there's a flag on every single play. And it's almost an unwatchable product. And this Texans-Bears game on Sunday Night Football certainly veered in that direction, if not altogether into that lane by the end of it before it was all said and done because, holy God, it was it was a debacle. It was a real debacle. The Texans scored only a field goal after halftime, but the defense made sure that was enough as the Bears were also only able to produce three second-half points. Not a single point was scored by anyone in the third quarter, which was devastating if you had the over 45 and a half like I did. Just a real kick in the dick. Shot that over right there, killed it on the spot. Didn't have a chance. (laughs) Fucking awful, awful third quarter for both teams. So two games into the season, before I get into some of the more, uh, some of the specifics around uh, Texans Bears, two games into the season, we have two wins that really didn't need to be nearly as stressful as they ended up being. It This came down to the wire in a way that it should not have, much like week one. Uh, in part because Cam Akers, who was in there obviously for, uh, oh my God, Joe Mixon. I'm still tired. Sunday Night Football, it's been a while since we had that and I had to adjust on Monday morning. But Cam Akers is in there for Joe Mixon after Mixon gets hurt, which I'll get to. Bad fumble on the four-yard line, on the Bears' four-yard line in the red zone. Can't have that. Everybody knows. If you turn the ball over in the red zone, bad things are going to happen. Bobby Slowick was in his bag in the first half, frankly. We saw the creativity and the spark that uh, his offensive scheme provides in the first half. And then, I mean, there was some creative and explosive offensive plays. Second half, they put the clamps on everyone. The offense, judging the game as a whole, looked relatively uninspiring. Texans had 310 yards of total offense compared to the Bears' 205 total yards. Neither team cracked 100 yards rushing. The Texans accumulated only 75 yards on the ground. The Bears with 71. Both teams had 15 first downs. The Bears actually possessed the ball longer than the Texans in this game. 31 minutes and 13 seconds compared to 28 minutes and 47 seconds, which is usually a pretty good indicator of who's going to win. So as you can see, statistically, like this thing was way, way, way too close. Uh, Even though watching the game and seeing the opportunities that we had on the field, like 
this it should not have been a one score game. Simply, it should not have been a one score game. And two games into the season, hilariously, our Houston Texans remain the only team in the AFC South with a win. Jaguars 0 and 2, Titans 0 and 2, Colts 0 and 2. And then to make matters even better in the AFC, the Baltimore Ravens 0 and 2, Cincinnati Bengals 0 and 2. So we're in a good spot to give some positivity here to an otherwise fairly negative game. We're in a great spot. Two wins, two games. Everyone else in our division is shitting the bed. This is exactly where we want to be. And as you know, as everyone who's a big fan of the NFL knows, a win is a win. You get a win. You celebrate the win. You move on to the next one. And that's that. But it's not that on this podcast where we judge each game accordingly. And uh, let's do that by talking about what happened with some of our players. First of all, MVP of this one, Kaimi Fairbairn, the kicker. Our kicker was the MVP, which is really not what you want, but you'll take it. This dude's a freak, though. He is officially one of the best kickers in the NFL, if not the best kicker in the NFL. He had four field goals, three of which were from 50 yards plus. He had a 56-yarder, a 47-yarder, a 59-yarder, and a 53-yarder. It was extremely impressive, and Fairbairn is a dangerous weapon. Having a great kicker like that can do a lot for your football team. As you drives that stall out, you know, around the 40-yard line or whatever, you've still got a chance to put some points on the board, which really ended up being the difference in this game, right? So great on Fairbairn. Love having him around. CJ Stroud was 23 for 36 for 260 yards. One touchdown to Nico Collins. No turnovers, which was once again key. But through two games, we've I, I would say we've seen maybe four plays where CJ Stroud really provided the magic that we know he is capable of. Again, it's been enough, but it hasn't been often. And uh, it's been kind of strange to see CJ through the first two games of his sophomore season being held under control a little bit more by opposing defenses, which we kind of expected, right? Going into year two, teams know how to scheme for you a little bit better than they did in year one when you were a rookie and nobody really knows what to expect. Um, But yeah, the difference in this game... There were multiple, obviously. Fairbairn was one of them. Another one ended up being Stroud staying composed versus Caleb Williams kind of freaking out and turning the ball over twice, which rookies are wont to do. Um, Nico Collins, another monster performance. This dude cannot be stopped. Eight receptions, 135 yards receiving, one touchdown, our only touchdown. And uh, yeah, I mean, not a whole lot to say about him. I I was kind of hoping that, you know, after what he was able to do in week one without getting into the end zone, uh, that he would draw even more attention in week two and that that would leave guys like Stefan Diggs and Tank Dell a little more open to produce. Didn't really unfold that way. And maybe the Bears just have a great secondary. I'm not super familiar with their game. Uh, It's been, you know, a few years since I really had to pay attention to the Bears. Uh, similarly to the way it is for a lot of fans who have not paid attention to the Texans for a few years. But, uh, yeah, it was hard for me to tell if it was just that they had a solid defense, which I think they did, much like the Colts were okay. Like, Bears were even more stout defensively than the Colts were. And uh, for whatever reason, our, our receivers had a really, really tough time getting open, particularly in the second half where it just seemed like C.J. Stroud could not get eyes on anybody downfield who was open. Joe Mixon. Nine rushes for 25 yards. Three receptions for 25 yards. Obviously got hurt and spent uh, a good amount of time on the sideline. Went back to the locker room a little bit. The hip drop tackle that was performed on him, performed on him that, w- that took him out of the game, is one of the things the NFL changed in the offseason that they're trying to get rid of. Oddly enough, this was like as textbook as it gets in terms of a hip drop tackle. And it was not flagged. Not only was it not flagged, when Joe Mixon stood up and told the referee, hey, that was a hip drop tackle, what the hell? The referee went, nah. And that was it. Now, I expect, I can't remember which defender it was, but the dude who performed the hip drop tackle, I expect him to get fined. And he won't be the only person who gets fined or disciplined uh, off the field for things that were not called during this game. Uh, I'll get to the other one in a second, but... Yeah, hopefully Joe Mixon's ankle holds up well the next couple days. He's got an MRI scheduled for today. Hopefully he gets good results there. We obviously need Joe Mixon. The running game went back to being 
extremely mediocre with him off the field. And then we had that uh, uh, very costly Cam Akers fumble in the red zone that you, you simply cannot have. Joe Mixon does not fumble the ball. That does not happen if he's still out there. So, yeah, consequential hip drop tackle kind of jacks up the running game in this one for the Texans. They were really just never able to get anything going uh, in the air or on the ground in the second half, obviously. Um, just just sloppy and shitty and sad in many ways. The offensive line, which last week we pointed to as the number one area of concern for this team, probably still the number one area of concern. Did not protect C.J. Stroud well enough. I think he got sacked thrice. Did not give him enough time to get the ball off. There were a couple of plays where C.J. held on to it too long, and like I was saying, it seems like the corners were blanketing the receivers pretty well. He could not find anyone downfield, but the pocket was collapsing almost every single time he dropped back. And the run blocking obviously wasn't great either, considering we didn't even crack. uh, We got, what, 75 yards on the ground. So um, Laramie Tunsil, another couple false starts here. Said it last week. We said it last year. He's good for a couple false starts every single game. I do not know what it is about Laramie Tunsil and the way that he functions that makes it impossible for him to remember the snap count or he gets too antsy and jumps off the line. I don't know what it is. But God damn it, it doesn't look like it's ever going to get fixed. Like at this point, at this point in his career, it's just like that's who he is. And it sucks. It's devastating. Um, and I wish there was something they could do about it. But my God, I don't, I don't know. I just I'm going to continue to shame him every week on the show and hope that maybe something happens uh, as a result. But yeah, the offensive line was not good. It was, it was once again something that, you know, as you're watching the game and you want more than anything CJ Stroud to be protected protection was just not good enough the run blocking was just not good enough either they got to improve there got to improve there the defense however was inspiring sacked Caleb Williams seven times he got absolutely wrecked several times like in the second half I started to feel bad for him because you know how it is when first of all you're watching a rookie quarterback it's already a challenge you're up against it the the speed of the game is totally different than college. Everything is totally different. It's insanity out there by comparison. And then on top of that, like the, the pass rush was fucking crazy. They were blitzing over and over and over. The defensive line was eating the Bears' offensive line. And uh, yeah, he, I was at one point, I'm just crossing my fingers hoping the kid doesn't get hurt. And you know, you don't want to see anybody get hurt in football. And this was, he looked, I mean, he was getting smashed, absolutely fucking smashed repeatedly. And uh, the defense was hitting, man. I mean, there were some huge hits, big hits in this game uh, from the Texans' defense. Daniel Hunter and Will Anderson Jr. were both beasts. Both had 1.5 sacks. Aziz Al-Shair, really good game, but he's likely going to be suspended for throwing a punch and making contact on the Bears' sideline. Now, the funniest thing about this, if you can call it funny, which I do, when Al Shair got up and threw that punch, I am like 95% sure he punched the wrong guy. Like he got up, somebody had pushed him or treated him in a way that he did not uh, uh, think was okay on that sideline. And he got up and just punched the dude directly to his right. And the guy had a look on his face like, what the fuck did I do? What did he say fuck me for? I, I don't know. I, that was just my judgment of it. They showed the replay a couple of times. I'm pretty sure he punched the wrong guy. So that made it funny. And then the dude was wearing a helmet. I don't know why NFL players do this, bro. Like, that has to hurt your hand more than it hurts his head or face. He's wearing a helmet, so you just punched him directly in the face mask. Because, again, this is football. So, it's just altogether idiotic move by uh, by Al Shayer. And he has to know better. He's got to be better. He's wearing the gigantic... Uh, Aziz is wearing the gigantic, like, uh, D'Amico Ryan's bionic padded arm thing like the arm pad that goes all the way down his arm which you used to see a lot back in like the 80s right like everybody was wearing all this crazy shit my dad told me that they used to like stuff pieces of metal into their uh into those pads on their arms and just like club people with them which is fucked up but um (laughs) the game has come a long way anyway he's wearing like the patented D'Amico Ryan's arm pad thing which I've never seen another Houston Texans player where you rarely see it in the league period but Aziz Al Shair has that thing going on. He played for D'Amico in San Francisco on the 49ers. Uh, great pickup. Like I said, great game. Dude plays aggressive, plays hard, plays fast. 
but then he let his emotions get the better of him and just fucking punch someone in their face mask. So I am expecting him to get suspended. It, it could just be a heavy fine, but I think it's going to be a suspension because if they had caught that on the field, he would have been ejected from the game. You cannot throw a punch. Everybody knows that. Because he didn't get ejected from the game and continued to play and make an impact on the game, my assumption is the NFL will suspend him if that hasn't been handed out already as I'm speaking, which is entirely possible. Um, so that's not good. That's a loss for next game, right? And then, uh, what, Stingley? Stingley Jr., who did not have a good game one, came out, had a fantastic interception in this one, which uh, makes you feel a little bit better about where he's at. And then uh, the other pick was Lassiter. Two interceptions. Both came in the second half. Both were absolutely essential to walking out of there with a win. So, altogether, a really good game from the defense. Very strong. But you're up against a rookie quarterback, and you're at home. All right, so I'm not going to give too much credit here. Because this is what needed to happen. This was the expectation that they would lock down Caleb Williams, prevent the Bears offense from being able to get much going, turn the ball over, which they did a couple of times, and that ended up winning the game. So no doubt, behind Kaimi Fairbairn, the defense is MVP runner-up in in Week 2. But still, got to continue to build, and they will not have, um, again, I'm assuming, but they will not have Aziz Alshair against Minnesota on the road in week three, which hurts. To take it back to the offensive side of the ball, Tank Dell. Oh, man. Forgettable game. And I think for me and and a lot of Texans fans, we got really, really high on Tank Dell during his rookie year last year before he got hurt. It was devastating when he got hurt because, one, he shouldn't have been in on that little pile up there in the red zone anyway. And two, he was doing so fucking well. Acrobatic catches, finding wide open field. He was like an incredible long ball threat. And that has just not been the case through two games this season. I don't know if he's still kind of getting his footing back. And, you know, obviously he was shot in the offseason as well, which he recovered from. Had a very bad drop in this one that would have been a big chunk play. And just was so uncharacteristic to see Tank Dell badly. I mean, this thing was for whatever reason, the broadcast and the commentators didn't seem to see that this was like on his hands. It was a dime of a pass from C.J. Stroud. And then during the replay, you could very clearly see the thing like basically, basically went through his hands. Uh, bad drop. He had one reception, Tank Dell, for minus three yards. And then three rushes for 16 yards. And you can see Bobby Slowick is clearly trying to find ways to get Tank Dell involved outside of the you know traditional passing game. Because he's just not getting open. It's just not there. So they're running these weird end rounds and toss plays for Tank Dell where he's effective. I mean, don't get me wrong, but he's also five foot fucking eight. And I don't love his little ass, no offense, all due respect, running around uh, like he's a fucking running back. Because he's, f- he's a little dude, man. That's why, why he got hurt. Why he never should have been in that pileup in, in uh, what is it, week like 12 last season or whenever that was that he got hurt. He's, he's, he's small. He's a small dude. Incredibly talented. Incredible athlete. But he's five foot eight. And if the only way we can get him involved in the offense is by running the ball with him, then that's fucking concerning for sure. We thought the big thing this year was going to be that we have such a stacked wide receiver room that it's going to be insane and, and impossible to double team anybody hasn't really been the way it's panned out through two games. That's early in the season. Everybody knows there's a lot of sloppy football at the beginning of the NFL season. A lot of really good teams play really bad football at the beginning of the NFL season. And then they get better and build week by week. And that's what's important, obviously, is how you pick up momentum, how you improve game by game, how your coaching staff makes adjustments, and how your players pick up on different things and and are able to shine more and more throughout the course of the season. And that's what you have to be hoping for from, from Tank Dell at this point because it's been a very forgettable first two games. This one might have been his worst game as a Houston Texan that he's had so far through the whatever, like, you know, 14 games he's played at this point. Um, but yeah, you can't have those drops. If you're struggling as much as you are to find the football and then finally the football finds you and you completely blow it, that's a tough look. It's a tough look. Forgettable game from Tank Dell. Stephon Diggs had four receptions for 37 yards. Nothing spectacular here. Um, Probably a forgettable performance for him as well. Just the offense in general was very lackluster, as I've said repeatedly. There was not a lot to get excited about on the offensive side of the ball. 
And uh, that's one of the things that made the game so frustrating. It was really a defensive showdown. I just got a notification as I'm talking. Chicago's Caleb problem, and I guess they're talking about how the offensive line is not protecting him enough. But, yeah, I mean, if you want to talk Caleb Williams for a second, you saw some, if you're a Chicago Bears fan, you definitely saw some things to be excited about, right? Um, talented scrambler, fast on his feet, threw some dimes. And the first quarter, really the first couple possessions, were extremely impressive. And then the wheels started to come off as he just got blitzed into oblivion. But um, I think some of the, you know, some of the things you want to see in a rookie quarterback, you're seeing them. In Caleb Williams, it just—I think the expectations for what he's going to be able to do are, are the bar was set pretty high with C.J. Stroud and, and our team last year and, and the Texans. So uh, Bears fans might have a tough time adjusting to that. But overall, I was overall impressed with Caleb Williams. They do need to do a better job of protecting him. You can't give up seven sacks, but frankly, a couple of few of those were on him because he's thinks he's like Mike Vick back there scrambling 20 yards in the wrong direction and it just it, even though he was able to come back and make up some ground and fr- he got like in one on one of the plays that I'm thinking of he got like one tackle away from breaking it off uh, and having a huge run but it didn't happen and he was getting killed out there you got to protect yourself that's obviously in this era of NFL football one of the most important things in every era but in this era especially with the young guys. I mean, you just you don't want to see your quarterback put themselves in a position to get hurt. That's what CJ has done a really good job of avoiding. Whereas like uh Tua Tagovailoa, I can't say his last name properly, does a terrible job of this obviously. Um you want to see Caleb Williams in the former category, not the latter. Got to protect yourself out there. Your offensive line has to protect you as well, but um yeah, le- glad to move past this one. And we're on to Minnesota next week because this was this was shit football. Like I said, it was not. It sucks because I feel like every I feel like every time we get a national game, like Sunday night football or Monday night football, it ends up being like this fucking shit show where you don't like the the national audience does not get to see how great this team could be. I, I'm obviously excluding the playoffs last year. We we had a great performance against the Browns. Um, I think nationally, people are aware of what the Texans have going. As they said in the broadcast, there are not many teams in the National Football League that have as many offensive weapons as the Texans have, if there are any at all. But then to not really go out there and show that, you know, scoring fucking 19 points on four field goals felt a little sad. It felt a little sad. So we go into week three, Minnesota Vikings. They're also 2-0. Who have they beat? They beat the Giants week one, 28 to 6. They beat the San Francisco 49ers week two, 23 to 17. That's a great win. They were at home against the Niners on Sunday. Um, so, yeah, this is every week is the same. It's the biggest game of the season. Biggest game of the season. Got to go 1 0 every single week, right? You got to swarm. Um, D'Amico had a better coaching game overall. I think there was still one play he challenged instead of challenging. The spot of the ball, I think he challenged whether or not it was a first down, and as a result, they ended up changing the spot of the ball, but we still lost our challenge. That seemed like a mistake. I could be wrong there. Um, If I am, correct me in the comments if you're watching on YouTube. But uh, overall, there weren't as many game clock management situations. Nothing really went awry in that arena like it did in week one. Um, we didn't leave any points on the board in terms of, uh, you know, being in the red zone and not kicking a field goal. That was all improved. But just god-awful discipline from all all over the field. Defense, offense, offensive line, defense, defensive backs. There was a couple of uh, holding holding calls and... uh, Defensive pass interference and shit that was just like, it was just unacceptable. There's, they got to be better in terms of the penalties. Obviously, everybody knows that. That was completely absurd. You cannot have 12 penalties for 115 yards. You will not win very many games that way. In closing, we did win this game. That is nice. We are 2-0. and That is nice. Many of our enemies are 0-2. That is nice. We're in a great spot. Now you go into Minnesota next week. Huge game. Good team. Also 2-0. and Got to make it happen. Got to be better. We'll see what happens. With uh, Joe Mixon, we'll see what happens with his, with his MRI. Um, other than him, I don't remember anyone else like memorable getting hurt, suffering an injury. So that's good health wise. 
But one of the huge improvements we made this offseason was improving the running back situation and getting Joe Mixon, so we need him to be okay. And we'll see what happens with the judgment of that that hip drop tackle that occurred. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll move on from there. A little bit of Astros before we end today's show. Great weekend for the Houston Astros, who are obviously in a situation where with only a few series left in the regular season, they've got to maintain that four-and-a-half game division lead over the... Um, what are these dickheads called? The Seattle Mariners. Ten and a half up on the Rangers now, so the Rangers are out of the picture. Very sad, very unfair. Won the World Series. Terrible season for the Rangers to follow it up. Uh, people are saying maybe the Texas Rangers are one of the worst World Series winning teams of all time. I gotta say, I, I have to concur. Uh, and yeah, so we're still four and a half up on the Mariners, who have won seven of their last ten. But the Astros won all three against the Angels in Anaheim this weekend. Friday, winning five to three with Yusei Kikuchi on the bump. Saturday, winning five to three with Justin Verlander on the bump. Sunday, winning six to four with Renel Blanco on the bump. Kikuchi has not lost. <laughs> we have not lost a single game that he started. I think we've won like nine now, eight, eight or nine straight with Kikuchi starting the game. Um, I think we can go ahead and chalk that Joey Loperfito and company trade up as a win for Dana Brown. That has panned out marvelously. Justin Verlander on Saturday still did not look like Justin Verlander. That is a huge concern for the Houston Astros rolling towards October. You got to get Verlander back in a place where you're at least confident that he can be your third or fourth guy in the rotation during the playoffs, which currently is not the case. And there is a lot of discourse online about whether or not Verlander should even be on the playoff roster. I still am in the camp of people who say that conversation is absurd. You people have lost your marbles. Verlander will get himself back. But at the same time, he is 40 fucking years old and uh, he's got to prove it. This was a better start for him on Saturday. But he still didn't really have the stuff that we expect to see when we see Justin Verlander, when we see JV uh, take the mound. So still need to see Verlander improve some more before the playoffs. But we've got a few series left, like I said, for him to do that. So he's going to have a few more starts. Um, we need to make sure that they're productive and really keep an eye on how, how his mechanics look and how you know his velocity and the break on the ball, all, all the factors that <laughs> matter in judging a pitcher. Um, Renel Blanco is Renel Blanco, so he's good there. Yeah, so we got three series, uh, three game series against the Padres starts tonight in San Diego. Arigetti on the bump tonight, so that's a challenging series. Obviously, the Padres are solid. Then they got a four game series against the Angels in Houston, which bodes well for the end result here because we just swept them in their house. It's the only four-game series we have left in this season, and it's against the Angels. It'll be at home. Got to win all four of those. You hope to come out of the Padres series with a, you know, a win, two games to one at the very least. Get all four against the Angels. If you drop one, maybe go 3-1, that's still okay. You're still in a great spot. You're still not going to lose your division lead. And then, really, what this is going to come down to at the end of September, which is rapidly approaching, the Astros have two very tough series to close out the regular season. Three-game series against the Seattle Mariners at home. That's going to make or break what's happening here. Obviously, the two series between now and then will come into play, but you have to assume things stay pretty tight between the Mariners, who are playing better baseball now, and the Astros. And when we have that three-game series against Seattle at home, uh, that's going to basically feel like a playoff game, like a playoff series. So then... We close out the season in a three-game series against the two-seed Cleveland Guardians in Cleveland. That's another team playing very good baseball. So you got six games to close out the year, three of which are against your closest divisional rival at this point. Um, that's going to be a lot of nail-biting for Astros fans coming down the stretch that I'm really fucking not looking forward to, if I'm being honest. But, uh, but that's what the Astros have left on the schedule. They're right there. they got 81 wins. They got a four and a half game lead in the division. The two seed is pretty much out of reach, barring a massive meltdown from the Cleveland Guardians, which I do not anticipate. Um, so this is it. This is the this is the tough part of the year where we're in a better spot than we were last year. Admittedly, I think that from a record and from a division standings and from a personnel standpoint, we are in a better spot than we were last year. Uh, we still need to see Kyle Tucker improve in terms of his health and get back into, you know, 
being our starting right fielder shape and, and playing every game. Uh, very cool to see him as productive as he has been as a pinch hitter, obviously. Came in and he <laughs> hit a fucking bomb on the first pitch uh, last game or the one before that. Um, Astros are in a good spot. It's time to go out and prove it. This is winning season. Back half of September, approaching October, is uh, a high-intensity baseball that they're about to be playing here, especially those last two series of the season, like I said. That'll do it for today's show. Remember, every episode of Banging the Can is available on all of the audio podcast platforms like Apple Podcasts and Spotify, but also in full video on YouTube.com slash at Banging the Can. Go subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube right now, hit the subscribe button. Hit it. Hit the subscribe button. We got to get up to like 10,000 subscribers before we can monetize the channel, and we're not there yet. So, subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. Leave a comment below about something you think I should have touched on, or something you just you think I you do you disagree with my take, or a question. If you got a question you want me to try to answer, I'll be happy to do so. Hit the comment section. Hit the like button on YouTube as well. Subscribe, like, comment, do all the things. And on that note, please share the most unapologetic Houston sports show in existence with your friends and family. Follow us on social media at Banging the Can on TikTok, on Instagram, on X, formerly known as Twitter. Support our sponsors when we have them. Today's sponsor is it's uh, it's me. I'm today's sponsor. So support me. Because we don't have a sponsor today is what I'm saying. We need sponsors. And to get sponsors, I need you to do things like tell your friends and family about the show and also hit the subscribe button on the fucking YouTube machine. Thank you. Check out Bolin Media's other shows. We've got Formula Bone giving you a recap and a preview of every single F1 race all season long, hosted by Jared J. Bone Boris Lowe. You can find Formula Bone at Formula Bone on all the social media platforms, and you can watch on YouTube.com slash at Formula Bone where uh, Formula Bone has over 120,000 subscribers or something. Way more than we do. Very unfair. Uh, go subscribe, youtube.com slash at Formula Bone. Formula Bone is also available on the podcast platforms if you are listening. If you love F1, you will love Formula Bone. It is the finest American-made F1 show in existence. Go check it out. Support Bolin Media. Also check out the Ross Bolin podcast. It's my comedy and sort of funny news and also kind of mental health show that I've been doing for like six years. Go check the Ross Bolin podcast out. If you love TV and movies, check out Oysters, Clams, and Cockles, where me and uh, one of my best friends of over 20 years, Mr. Barrett Dudley, who is also a uh, native Houstonian, will be covering The Penguin as our next show, uh, which begins this Thursday. The Penguin premieres on HBO. We'll be covering it episode by episode on Oysters, Clams, and Cockles, available wherever you get your banging the can. I am Ross Bolin. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at WRBolin. I'll be back next week. Until next time, go Texans H-Town. Stay down.